rascally students in this class said, oh, God, how many pictures have you made of Edith? <laughs> <laughs> Another one. <laughs> and, I, 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 and I said, not enough. <laughs> So often in a group like this, there's a brilliant question out there that proposes something that I would never think of. So I'm going to be open to that question. I'm going to tell you just a very simple story. My father was a Methodist minister. I was born in Danville, Virginia, because my father had Stokesland Church and Fairview Church, two white wooden churches in 39, 40, 41. Born. They moved away soon after that. It was only when I was 15 that we moved back to Bend. And I remember that really well. Wow, this is a city. This is so <laughs> mysterious, so interesting. Um, to be careful how I say this, but I remember that first morning turning along what's now Memorial Drive, but it was come across the main bridge, Main Street Bridge, and turn right. These pitiful shanty wooden houses mm -hmm. that lined the river. Mm -hmm. it, it so touched me. Uh, this is such a, a real place. Well, my parents wanted me to follow my father into the ministry. That was not going <laughs> but I had to play my cards very carefully, so I went to business school for a couple of years. I didn't really like school that much. Business school gave me a little courage, and during that time I was having little experiences, some way or another, about art. Once I got off to Richmond, and uh, I was in RPI, BCU, NAP, uh, I knew I was home. I adored my teachers. There were just a small handful, it's not even a handful, it's three, three or four people can totally change your life. Then I, we were married in my senior year, just before my senior year. Edith always working, keeping us. She said I married her for her money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to think that with all that money, I also got this amazing intelligence. Wow. My mother, on the completion of my master's degree, I studied with Harry Callahan in Rhode Island. And when, at, at that ceremony, Diplomas. My mother kind of caught up with me and put on a little gesture that I probably learned from her. She said, Emmett, we're so proud of you. We're so glad you became a photographer. It was the closest I ever heard my mother come to telling an untruth. <laughs> Portland to the Museum of Art and 
important to give a lecture. And I'm just, I'm offering it up on the spur of the moment. It would actually be fun if there were 20 people who wanted to gather and hear a talk about what a life in photography is. I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> There are, a lot, there are a lot of stories. I want to open things up for questions, but before I do it, listening to Glenn just made me <laughs> smile so deeply. <laughs> he will remember in 63, we were walking into oh, yeah. Hollywood <laughs> Cemetery in Richmond, where a lot of the Civil War dead are buried. And, and that was a predominantly black ghetto, really on the <clears throat> edge. And we're two white guys walking the streets with our little cameras hanging from the hands and, and music. He looks up, and I see a police car go by behind us. And, and a block later, I see the same police car go back the other way. And I said, they're after us. <laughs> <laughs> they're watching us. They're thinking, what are you white guys doing here? Don't you realize this is dangerous? I'm, I'm not interested in the racial interested in the policeman. I and the police car pulled up beside the two of us. And he says, you got anything with your name on it? Civil War cemetery at the edge of night next to a black community where as soon as it's dark, you boys won't be safe. I guess you like that, don't you? And Glenn says, yes, I like it, but not as much as he does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, might I add, that in my defense, I didn't even realize in that walk in and walk out, I made some incredible photographs. And the thing that's interesting, I never printed them. I just found them, and I'm printing them now. Really? Very cool. So the idea is, remember what I said? You get images in, you can't get it out. It gets in, you can't get rid of it. And they were there all the time. I just had to take the time and go look at them. Let's have a display. Well, <laughs> parents feel this about their children. You're never finished. Yeah. You're never finished with your children. I have a question in that vein. I understand your son is also a photographer. Did you say to him, in all honesty, I'm glad you became a photographer? <laughs> <laughs> I want to quote, I want to quote a friend on this. Why shouldn't the parents not understand what you're going to become? Because not even you know what you're going to become. That's right. Uh, it's impossible to give useful advice. Just to, to take that as a gospel. It's impossible to give useful advice. I, I thought of coming back to this little thing, the show that's at the Morgan Library now. And it's really a, a pinnacle show for us. I mean, I feel like we're in it together. It's a former student that I knew at Princeton while he was working on his PhD has gone to, uh, not to, not to Vassar, back to the Met. He was an intern at the Met, he wrote a book at the Met became a specialist on Saul Steinberg, brilliant young man, served at Princeton as curator of photography for five years, and then went on to become the first curator at the Morgan Library and Museum. Wow. It's, it's a jewel of a museum, an amazing collection. That, that, that uh, J.P. Morgan was a tyrant has nothing to do with art. <laughs> 
amazing that this is a footnote. I, I looked at the acquisition dates on the material that we ended up choosing. We had the full range of the entire museum's collection to choose from. But we were choosing things that, that he and I together, but me in particular, could say yes. They were bought by J.P. Morgan in 1909, 10, 11, 12. It's just a span of a, just a little micro moment out of the universe's history. This man with way too much money <laughs> is buying unbelievable objects. Well, it's, it's up until September the 20th, if you go to New York. And it's where? And museum. It's also a small show in the Nelson Atkins right now. Fifth Avenue and something? Mm -hmm. uh, the address? The address of the Morgan is 36th Street and Madison Avenue. Madison. Right. It's, um, that's, that's the uh, catalog you would get. This, this is it. the catalog you would get. Show, and that's, that's, I was just holding on to this as a sort of memory device. I got another question. I don't have a session between the semesters and I would sit around with the graduate students for a week. We didn't have any real project or anything, but we would converse, we'd talk about the books we'd read, and we'd just have a good time. And during that time, I made the picture, actually processed it that winter while I was at Yale. That's on the little announcement, the Christmas morning oh, picture. And I knew then not just intuitively, but I knew it deeply from the history of the medium that that was a new image. That was a genuine, authentic moment. And I was feeling very expansive. I had this truly new thing, and I was saying something about, well, I, I was just talking. I don't even remember what it was. And this graduate student that was with me said, oh, well, that's a little bit. You're, you're just a little too over the top. You're just too excited about your life. <laughs> you're just, did, did you, you give know, him a grade? <laughs> no, he could say a thing like that because I didn't give grades. There was nothing to do with grades in this exchange. There was something so genuine in the, what he had said that I uh, learned that day to say this this particular way, I looked at him and I said, you know, you're right, I am over the top. There is, there's something when you come to the edge of your experience and when you, you no longer fear authority, you will say what is your heart. Wow. Exactly. I said, but you're right, if I hadn't met I hadn't married you, you would 